Welcome everyone. It's so great to be here with all of you this evening. My name is Jacob Goldberg, and I'm the Program and Enrollment Manager for Naropa University's Extended Campus. Extended Campus is Naropa's newly re-energized Extended Studies program, dedicated to continuing education, public programs, and special events just like this one. Tonight, Extended Campus is thrilled to present an intimate dialogue with Natanel Miles Yepes. Natanel is an artist, author, philosopher, religion scholar, and spiritual teacher. He's the co-founder and current peer of the Inayati Maimuni Order, a lineage of Sufism which merges Sufi and Hasidic principles. Pierre Natanel is considered a leading thinker in the interspiritual and new monasticism movements, and we at Naropa are elated to have him as a member of our Wisdom Traditions faculty. Joining Natanel in conversation is Greg Yamada. Greg is a graduate student pursuing a Master's of Religious Studies here at Naropa, and he'll be acting as the facilitator and interviewer this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Greg to introduce himself a little bit more and kick things off. Thank you all so much for coming and I hope you enjoy. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to, to have you here. Um, I'm here with Natanel, and as Jacob said, my name is uh, Greg Yamada and I am a grad student at the University of Naropa and I'm in the religious studies department and I've had the, uh, the honor and pleasure of having Natanel as my professor for Sufism classes and classes on Islam. And he also has been the, uh, the mentor of my cohort. So I've had the benefit of his uh, guidance at my time here. But uh, the occasion for our discussion today is a book that he's published recently called The Merging of Two Oceans. And um, this book is about two of the world's great mystic traditions Sufism and Hasidism, and the ways in which they have been in conversation and have informed each other both historically and living in the world today. So welcome. Thank you. Let's just jump right in. Um, one of the things I love about this book is that, you know, it's both of those, both of those traditions are, are really known for their rich storytelling. Um, both Sufism and Hasidism, and this book is full of all kinds of stories. There's historical stories, there's um, mythical stories, but there's also bi biographical and autobiographical stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you are the peer of a Sufi lineage, the Anayati Maimuni, which Jacob mentioned, but um, that is a relatively new order and is really sort of sitting on the cusp of this merging of the two oceans and really brings together two beautiful tra traditions. And so um, I guess what I'd like to do to start is I'm wondering if to kind of invite everyone in to the room, if you could tell a story about these two lineages and how, how they sort of have interacted and been in, rela in relationship with each other over the years. Well, there's a story with which I, I begin the book. And uh, to me, it's, it's the best story I know of, of good, friendly relationship between two, two religious traditions. And it's a story that I heard from my teacher that comes from probably the 18th century uh, and may have happened to historical persons. So, the story begins in Damascus in the 18th century and involves a, a, a known personage uh, from the Jewish tradition, Rabbi Moshe Galanti. And Rabbi Moshe Galanti was a Kabbalist. Um, you know, he would, would have been spoken of as a tzaddik, uh, a righteous person, a righteous leader. And he was also known to be a baki. And baki is a word that means an expert. And in this case, it meant that he was a highly educated man and was an expert in what were called then the seven wisdoms. Uh, I don't know if I can remember them all at this moment, like grammar, rhetoric, uh, geometry, astronomy, uh, logic, music. I don't know how many I just did. <laughs> call it seven. <laughs> we'll call it seven. <laughs> and so he was uh, learned in all of these traditions. And in Damascus, you know, he's a Jew, uh, you know, in a kind of refugee community in a Muslim country. And 
he was pretty much the the chief rabbi of Damascus, so the head of all rabbis and all congregations in Damascus at this time. And a deep mystic, um, learned in his tradition, many people came to him for answers and for prayers. And one day he was surprised to learn, kind of, you know, on the side, many members of the Jewish community were going to see a Muslim dervish for prayers for healing. In fact, he, the, he hears the rumor that if a person is, is seriously ill and they want to know whether they're going to live or whether they should, you know, God forbid, put their affairs in order <laughs> and get ready for moving on, uh, they would go to see this holy dervish, as they called him. And the holy dervish would pray for them, and then he would tell them, yes, you'll live, or no, put your affairs in order. <clears throat> and so Rabbi Moshe, he, he hears this, uh, this story that the members of his Jewish congregation are going to see a Muslim uh, for prayers, and that and then he can actually tell them whether they'll live or die, and he's always correct. And even though it says in the Talmud that uh, Rabbi um, Hanina ben Dosa could also do such a thing, it passes his understanding to believe that a Muslim could do the same thing. So when he hears this rumor, he's angry and wants to call the congregations together and wants to kind of rail against them from the pulpit and say, you know, how dare you go see a Muslim? You know, we're already a refugee community. We Jews have to stick together. But it's a strong Jewish legal principle that you should investigate every matter carefully before passing judgment. And so a good man uh, Rabbi Moshe sits down at his desk, pens a very polite invitation to the Holy Dervish, invites him to lunch, to tea. And the Dervish accepts the invitation, comes to tea. <clears throat> and they sit down for a little conversation. And Rabbi Moshe, a learned man, wants to see, well, what does this man know? And very quickly, he begins to to learn that the man is no, you know, kind of huckster, no charlatan. He's tremendously learned also, and a great gentleman. And so he starts to test him, and he finds that in one wisdom after another, grammar, rhetoric, logic, you know, uh, astronomy, you know, all of these things he seems to know and be just as learned as Rabbi Moshe himself. In only one of the wisdoms does he seem to be deficient, music. And there's an explanation for this because music has a, a difficult relationship within Islam. There are those in, within Islam that condemn music as leading to kind of ecstatic behavior that which may be inappropriate. And it's a great tension in the Islamic tradition whether music is a good thing or a bad thing. Among Sufis it's usually legitimized. And, but it's maybe not so surprising that the Holy Dervish doesn't really know the principles of music as it's taught in these kind of uh, uh, traditions of wisdom. So the Dervish realizes, oh, well, Rabbi Moshe knows music. Perhaps he can teach me. And he says, would you be willing to teach me this wisdom? It's the only wisdom I've never learned. You know, please reveal it to me. And Rabbi Moshe says, he says, I'm truly surprised. Like, I really enjoy your company. You're a learned man, a gentleman. I'm surprised at this. And I apologize that I'm surprised at this. And, and I would love to teach you this wisdom and continue our conversation. But I'd like to ask you a favor. That once when I've taught you this wisdom, perhaps you will grant me a request. And the dervish says, 
it will be my honor if I am able and it's in my power to grant you that request I will do it so they continue and they meet week after week and finally the dervish who's already a very you know a great intellect you know he learns the principles of music pretty well and they reach a point where he says to Rabbi Moses Moshe he says I've, I've gleaned these principles I think at at least at this point maybe I can grant you a favor please tell me what it is that you requested in the beginning and Rabbi Moshe says well, it's come to my attention that people come to you for prayer and after praying, you can somehow tell them whether they're going to live or die. I would like to know by what means you're able to do this. And at this, the dervish sighs. And he says, that's a very difficult matter and not an easy request for me to grant. But I've given you my promise that I will try. But it's going to require some things of you. <clears throat> First, I need you to go home and sincerely repent and pray to be worthy to receive such teachings. Now, you know, Rabbi Moshe is, is, a, is a tzaddik, is a righteous person. It is a great part of his life to spend his life in repentance and in prayer. And now to be told by a Muslim that he needs to actually repent of something and prepare himself to, re to learn some sort of wisdom, it, it gets to his ego a little <laughs> and raises his hackles. But a gentleman, he maintains his composure and says, of course, I'll do that. So he returns home. And he thinks little of this. This is just in the course of his life, you know, pray, repent, pray, repent. It's something that he does normally. So he spends the week in prayer and repentance, comes back the next week to the Holy Dervish. And he says, now I'm ready. And the Dervish looks at him with a discerning eye and says, no, no, my friend, you're not. And quite honestly, Rabbi Moshe is, he says, what do you mean? What, what, what's wrong? He says, you still don't think I have anything to teach you. And Rabbi Moshe, knowing that that's true, turns and goes back home. And now he sincerely repents. And it gets to the heart of things. And he prays to God, Rabbono Shel Olam, Master of the Universe. This dervish is seen through me. He was right. I didn't really think he had anything to teach me. And now I'm afraid that he does. And you have to understand that that's a real fear for a Jew of this period. You know, religions are not together. It's like you're one religion and you're right and everybody else is wrong. And if they're from the other religion, they're right and you're wrong, you know, and that's how it is. And to believe that it's possible that, that there's something to learn from the other side is to shake the foundations of your very faith. And now, having been seen through, he wonders if that dervish has him something to teach him. And if he does, what does that mean about his own life and faith? And so he prays and sincerely repents and says, I, I swear, God, I want to learn this for a holy purpose. I think this is worth investigating. Um, please keep me in a holy place as I try to do this. I try to do it sincerely. And he reaches the place of humility where he breaks through into repentance and returns to the dervish. And now the dervish looks at a different man and says, good. You're ready. Come with me. And they pass through the dervish's home to a courtyard in the back. And 
the kind of courtyard we're talking about is something that was originally called a paradise. Now, our word paradise really originally meant an enclosed garden, uh, a garden within walls where things, uh, you know, your garden could be curated, as it were, you know, and tailored and everything made beautiful and perfect. And that was the idea of a, of a paradise. And so this dervish has such an enclosed garden, a very large one, and they pass into it and they go to the center of it. And in the center is a very, very large pond. In the center of the pond is a small island and some beautiful white marble building on top of that island. And the dervish says, we're going to that island. And it's, it's a very large pond. And the, the rabbi says, how are we going to get there? He says, come with me. Off the side of the pond is a small building. The two enter it. And inside, the dervish says, there's a stair down here that goes under the water. We're going to disrobe here. We'll take off our clothes. We'll walk down the stair and swim under the water to the island and we'll come up on another stair that leads into that building. In the building, there are two chambers, an outer chamber where there'll be two robes for us. We'll put on the robes and then you'll close your eyes and we'll pass into the inner chamber. Once in the inner chamber, I'll take your hand and we will make seven prostrations. At the end of the seven prostrations, I'll squeeze your hand again. Then it's time to pray for the person you need to pray for, whether they will live or die. And at the end of a few minutes, I'll squeeze your hand once more, and then you're to open your eyes and look straight ahead. And afterwards, we'll prostrate again and back out and so on. So the rabbi's terrified. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they strip, they pass down the stairs, they swim under the waters until they come to a stair come up the stair and they're in the outer chamber. They put on the robes, he closes his eyes, and this is the moment of greatest terror for the rabbi. Because one of the worst heresies for a Jew is to prostrate before an idol. And so you would never want to bow with your eyes closed, not knowing what might be in front of you. If there's an idol there, then you're now guilty of, of some sort of heresy within Judaism. And so you don't prostrate in any place where there's a cross in the Christian world. You just don't know what's in front of you. So to bow down, to be in such a situation where he's in the hands of this dervish is terrifying. And so as he closes his eyes, he's uh, praying almost in desperation. Rabbono shel olam, you know, master of the universe, please know that I'm not, I hope I'm not doing this out of arrogance. I'm really trying to learn a secret here, a mystery that I need to understand. If there's an idol in front of me, please know I have no intention of bowing to an idol. My only intention is to bow before you at all times. Please understand this. Please understand this. Please, you know, and so he's being led into this chamber and that's what's going on in his internal dialogue. They go into the chamber. He prostrates once, twice, thrice, again and again. After the seventh prostration, the dervish squeezes his hand and Rabbi Moshe begins to pray very hard about the person whose need that he's brought to this moment. He speaks the need, he speaks the person's name, the person's mother's name, all the things that are necessary to get into the place of knowing what will be necessary for, for this person's healing. Finally, he feels the dervish's hand, squeeze his hand once more, and he raises his head, opens his eyes, and there on a wall opposite him is the name of God. 
and it's as if it's outlined in brilliance. There's a light that comes off of it and shines into his eyes and into his heart. And just at that moment, the dervish squeezes his hand again. They rise, they prostrate one more time. They rise, they back out of the room as you back out of a holy space. You bow on leaving it. They go back into the exterior chamber, put the rope, well, no, they got the robes on. <laughs> they take the robes off. They swim under the water, go back to the little pavilion that's on the edge of the pond. They come up and the dervish turns to him now. And the rabbi says, I can't talk. I, I can't even deal with what just happened. I got to go. I'll talk to you another time. He puts on his clothes and runs out of the house. And for the next week or so, he's in an internal process. At the end of it, he calls the shamus, the, um, the attendant for the synagogues, <clears throat> and says, bring all the congregations together. I want to talk to them. And so the shamus gathers uh, all the people, you know, all the Jews of Damascus, into one place where he can speak to them. And he says, I know you've all been going to see the holy dervish um, to ask for prayers. And at first I was inclined to be angry about this. But I've now met him and now investigated the matter very thoroughly. And I want to say, it's all right. It's all right. You can do this. You can do this because he does something from which we can all learn. He holds the holy name in such a way, in such great sanctity, that we don't even come close to it. We mention the holy name here and here again and again, and we see it in our scriptures, and it's become normal to us. But I can truly say that he honors the name better than we. And it's, it's the end of the story. And the, the interesting thing about the story <clears throat> is that such stories of positive content, you know, that are about a positive connection between two different traditions like this, don't usually aren't usually allowed to survive like they don't come to our day because you know there's a competition between traditions and often the reason that they do survive is because is either because somebody's made some little change in them that makes it more acceptable or because there's an, an um what we might call a triumphalist assumption the triumphalist assumption that probably allows this story to survive is that many Jews assume that the divine name written on the wall was the divine name in Hebrew. And the story doesn't say that at all, but many people tend to assume that, that on that wall would be yod he vav he in Hebrew. <clears throat> but very likely, it was simply Allah probably written in beautiful Arabic calligraphy in Alif, Lam, Lam, and Aha. And in some ways, you know, we don't know what he saw. We don't know what it meant that the, the letters were outlined in brilliance, whether that meant the person would live or die. The point of the story is not whether, you know, you know what the flashing light meant or not, and what he understood by it, but it was that there's a, there's a way of engaging the sacred that maintains its, um, well, that sacralizes the sacred. You know, everything is inherently sacred, but we profane it. And so how do we re-sacralize it? Here it was maintained in sanctity. And, and the point was that if somebody from another tradition could do that so well, it may mean that the, you know, that the truth is beyond, you know, the, the boundaries of our traditions. And 
And this was kind of an enlightening moment for him. And it's wonderful that this is a historical figure, you know, and it's actually not that long ago. But the possibility of true communication between traditions is so recent. It's really, in, in the way we would think about it now, all, it was only re really beginning to be possible in the last hundred years, and probably especially in the last 50. And so this is a remarkable story, a long story. <laughs> I, I hope not too long, but it's, it's the one that I open this book with and and i see as the possibility for opening a dialogue between two traditions yeah thank you yeah thank you for bringing that story into the space <clears throat> i really love that story and you know there's parts of it that uh you know the, the journey into the into the into the paradise and into the center of the island that feel almost dreamlike or crossing worlds and you know in the the uh the, the ability to sort of that inward lookingness of realizing what, you know, what repentance is and then what true repentance is. It's really, um, it's really cuts right into it. Mm -hmm. So thanks for kind of bringing that into the space. And, yep. um, you know, as you, as you share that story, one of the things you mentioned just right at the end there was this idea of the, this possibility of, of the traditions that we are, that have, that are here and that are starting to maybe become more in conversation with each other and more maybe able to see what each has to offer um and you know as i mentioned just in the opening that a lot of a lot of what this book tells about is this emerging of a new sufi order mm -hmm. and um you know and the the founder of that order is our beloved reb zalman and um you know i'm sure many of you here on the call tonight are familiar with him in one way or another and you know he's the founder of Jewish Renewal and was the held the wisdom chair at Naropa for many years and it's a you know a beloved practitioner and guide for many of us um, but you know many people may not be as aware that Reb Zalban was in fact a Sufi mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and in the in the book one of the things you share is that one of the things he said in all of the different traditions that he, you know, he was an example of this kind of emerging possibility of being really rooted in a particular faith, but then being open to different experiences and how they might, you know, you know, coalesce together. Um, but you share that one thing that he said that, that like, among all of the other traditions was that uh, he was always most at home with the Sufis. But um, I'm wondering for, you know, the people that are enjoining today, can you say a little bit about, you know, how did Reb Zalman become a Sufi? Like, how does that happen? <laughs> uh, it happens when you give rein to great curiosity, and he was a person of tremendous curiosity. Uh, it was one of his characteristics. Um, and even, you know, you know, he died at 89, just short of his 90th birthday, and he never lost that curiosity. He was interested in people. He was interested in new subjects. And I really saw it as a, a, a characteristic, you know, that I wanted to, um, you know, model on. Um, but he, he did come out of what would now be called an ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, out of a Hasidic community. Um, he was an immigrant, you know, a Holocaust survivor, born in Poland, raised in Vienna, and then forced to leave, you know, kind of Nazi oppression. And he comes to New York and, and he enters a Hasidic sect, uh, which is mystically oriented and he's trained very well in it. And, and is thoroughly Hasidic, thoroughly Jewish, thoroughly Orthodox. And yet he has this curiosity, which it was a quality that would have been considered dangerous for him. <laughs> and, and the thing that kind of uh, led to, you know, his downfall, and, and these were his words, you know, <laughs> his fall from grace, as it were, was, was curiosity. And he, at a point in the 19, you know, late 1940s and early 1950s, he was teaching children a lot. 
and he was very interested in early childhood development hmm. and and at that time he went to the Yale library and he because he was looking for books on you know uh, psychological development in children um, and on his way into the library they had a kind of new books table and he said there were two books on the table that caught his eye one was the the world bible by robert balu mm -hmm. which is kind of a collection of stories and scriptures from all the traditions his copy is just over on my shelf here <laughs> and he found this book and he kind of uh was in, uh, immediately magnetized by it and you know wanted to grab it and take it home and another book that was called difficulties in mental prayer by a trappist monk a christian trappist monk and he was like, mental prayer? I thought only we Jews had such a thing, meaning deep contemplative or discursive meditation. And, and that was a revelation to him. There were people in other religions that did what was done in his tradition. He opens the World Bible and he finds uh, sayings of Ramakrishna that match sayings out of the Hasidic tradition. And it's just a revelation. So he becomes more and more curious about other religions, goes on to study about them more formally, studies pastoral psychology. Um, among his readings, he finds Sufi readings. Hmm. And for a number of years, I'm sure that's only what it was, that he's reading Idris Shah books. Uh, he, he had read Hazrat Anaya Khan. And come the early 1970s, he's expanding his horizons quite a bit. And he's spending a lot of time in the Bay Area. And at that time, he's meeting um, what are called Inayati Sufis or Universalist Sufis off of the lineage of Hazrat Anayat Khan, and becomes very close to them. Many of them are young Jews who have left Judaism for Sufism. He likes them, he likes their music, he likes their practices. And Rib Zaman was a genius, like he, he really mastered the things that he read, he knew them very well. And so he, he's pretty deep into the Sufi readings and he likes these people and somehow comes to a decision that he would like to be a Sufi initiate. Now a, becoming a mm -hmm. Su Sufi initiate in a in a universalist Sufi order might be different than becoming one in an, an Islamic Sufi order. And that was a difference that made it possible for him. <clears throat> uh, because he thought he could keep his commitments as a Jew and become a universalist Sufi at the same time. And he went to um, the successor of a person that some of you will have heard of, Sufi Sam or Murshid Samuel Lewis. Um, who was one of the first American Sufi masters and who was Jewish, but he died just a couple years before and Reb Zalman never met him. Mm -hmm. But he met and became friends with Murshid Sam's young successor, Pir Moinadine. And he, he goes to Pir Moinadine and says, I think I'd like to be initiated. And Pir Moinadine demurs because he's probably 29 years old and Reb Zalman is probably, you know, 50 ish at this point and a, clearly a master and Pir Moinadine does not feel up to initiating <laughs> somebody that's more master than he. Yeah. And so Moinadine says to him, he says, uh, I don't think I can initiate you. <laughs> I think you need somebody that's more at your level. And he says, uh, Pir Valide and Ayat Khan is going to be coming through here pretty soon, and perhaps he can initiate you. And Pir Valayat was the son of Hazrat and Ayat Khan, who had brought, the, was the original Sufi master to bring Sufism into the West. And this was the son, who is half American, half Indian. And Pir Valayat's a little older than Reb Zalman, uh, they're of us. Uh, similar levels of mastery as it were so it's not as big a deal so they arrange uh, a thing that has probably rarely happened in the history of religions 
um, uh, they arranged to do initiations across traditions. Mm. And it begins first with Reb Zalman seeking the Sufi initiation. And they meet maybe in Santa Cruz, I think. And Reb Zalman, before the initiation, goes to a mikveh to ritually immerse in water, comes out of it, and he dresses. Maybe this is like our story. You know, yeah, it's funny. Way. I'm we're noticing some of the parallels. Yeah. Two great masters meeting. And... But when he comes out of the water, he dresses in, in, he dresses the way a chassid would dress. But the way a chassid would dress formally in a black silk bekesha, uh, like a, uh, a kaftan, but one that closes with buttons and has a silk belt. And he wears a Russian fur strimal, a Russian round hat, you know, in the style of the Hasidic tradition. And, and I think of that and I think, well, that's a statement. He's going to a Sufi initiation, initiation but he's going as a Hasid. He's saying, I'm not divest, divesting of who I am. I'm, I'm going as who I am mm -hmm. to take on this initiation. And so it must have been a beautiful moment for whoever got to witness this because there's Pir Velayat in his beautiful white robes and his beautiful beard and long hair and Rib Zalman dressed in his finery. And they kneel down before one another to do this initiation. And in the middle of the initiation, Pir Velayat, who was known for his great um, intuition, suddenly opened his eyes and said, I can't make you a murid, which is to say, I can't make you a disciple. He says, in here, it's clear, you're a master. Mm. You're not going to be my disciple. And, and so he continues the initiation, but he makes him a sheikh, uh, which is pretty much the equivalent of what Reb Zalman was within his own tradition, a kind of Rebbe, a master. Mm. And, and so Reb Zalman is surprised by this and he says well what are my duties and Pirvalayat says well you'll know but until then you know treat it as uh, like a an honorary degree <laughs> until you do know and so in this way he became a Sufi Sheikh uh, after this, Pir Velayat asked Reb Zalman for an initiation. This is a little lesser known, even, yeah. even this story is rare, but this is even rarer story, that he asked Reb Zalman for an initiation into uh, what is called the, the priestly order of Malkitzedek, or Melchizedek as some people know it, Malkitzedek, the king of righteousness, a mysterious figure in the Bible, who seems to be a monotheist before Abraham and does some sort of initiation for Abraham. And, and Pir Velayat, in exchange, wants this initiation that seems to be held in the Jewish tradition wow. and asks for it from Reb Zalman. And about a year later, they do that initiation. Uh, this is why I, I tend to joke that I'm their love child. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's what comes of these mixing of traditions yeah um the last thing to add about that that story is that um uh it's the part that connects to me is that rib zalman uh for many years considered himself in in sufism an, an uncle and not a papa that's what he'd say mm -hmm. i'm an uncle and not a papa which is to mean your father you know a parent has has responsibility for you uh, whereas an uncle can dis, you know, can give advice, can give candy, can give coins, <laughs> but they're not responsible for you. And, and so he tried to be a good uncle to Sufis for many years and was, but he didn't want the responsibility of taking an initiate. And as far as I know, I am Reb Zalman's only initiate in Sufism. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Well, uh, We'll come back to that. I'd like to speak on that more, but I want to say, you know, thank you for sharing that story. You know, that bringing his presence, I can feel his presence in the room with us and mm -hmm. in the group field. And um, 
one of the things that was coming to me as you were speaking about it is, uh, you know, there's uh, there's this there's very large, you know, spiritual but not religious movement happening, and um, and I think there's a lot of people that maybe feel maybe lost within their like traditional religious traditions, um, but you know, you're speaking to this story, and you know, so many, pretty much every world religion has like a a mystical and contemplative dimension to it. And I was, I noticed I felt a little, a lot of excitement actually about the things that are possible in this day and age with this kind the level of connection and communication that we have available that, um, you know, it, there is also room for this, this, you know, these new, you know, cross pollinations and experiences and sharing that can happen. And when these, when these rich traditions come together in ways that where you know true practitioners who come fully as they are and then say well what more is there to be to be embraced like these really magical things start to happen mm -hmm. and so i just wanted to speak to to what i feel is like a, is like some magic and excitement around that possibility that is you know this is happening in our lifetime and it's something that is maybe for seekers of this day and age something that we can be a part of and, and bring forward in the world mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, you know, people like to, especially people that come from within traditions, sometimes have a little judgmental attitude about where things are today. Like, um, they kind of talk about, you know, spiritual, but not religious or people that are exploring religions, uh, you know, as kind of supermarket spirituality. And there's definitely that element, uh, you know, and spirituality has definitely been co-opted, you know, by marketers and, and so on. Um, and there's a lot of idea that it's all picking and choosing and that you're only picking, you know, the elements that taste good or that mm. you like or that are <laughs> exotic. And sometimes that criticism forgets that there were people like Rib Zalman and people like Pir Vilayat who were firmly and deeply rooted in a tradition and from the roots felt the confidence to explore and talk to one another without worry that they were going to lose something or diminish something, but they spoke from their confidence mm -hmm. and exchanged things very organically. And it wasn't all this process of just an immature spirituality picking and choosing, but there there are fusions that the planet wants mm -hmm. the planet loves diversity mm -hmm. you know loves diverse ecosystems it likes diverse interactions you know we struggle against that okay. in our social structures trying to main what we think maintain what we think is some sort of integrity or purity yeah. but but we know that you know from a biological standpoint those things diminish and die it's diversity that strengthens. And so I think there have been practitioners that work from this place, which is much healthier. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, yeah and um, as, you, as you're speaking to that, you know, one of the things that you opened with was Reb Zalman's curiosity, right? And, um, and his willingness to, you know, you talked about the World Bible and all these teachings that he found from these different traditions. And one of the things you, you, um, you talk about in the book and that I, I thought maybe we could might be fun to have a little taste of is that uh, you know so one of the you, know, you mentioned Hazrat Inayat Khan who brought Sufism to the West and started this universalist movement you know he one of the really most really beautiful practices or prayers that he brings into being is this uh, towards the one prayer and it's uh, it's a prayer that's that was authored originally in English and in the book I think you know you're very fond of it and. You say something like um, that it stands among the great prayer creations of the English language and probably will forever. Um, but you also talk about how Reb Zalman took that prayer and <laughs> and made translated it in, into Hebrew and mm -hmm. made a Hebrew version of it. And I just love the sort of like the mixing of time and place and like a oh an English prayer being translated back into Hebrew for like a, for a contemplative purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, there, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to maybe just share the prayer with us 
both in English and in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and kind of bring it into the space. Well, this is something Reb Zalman did, like, uh, when he was inspired about something that he read in English or another language, sometimes he, he had a great desire to hear it in his native language. And his native language was actually German. Um, but, the, you know, the language of his soul was Hebrew. And in particular, not, not the modern Hebrew of Israel, you know, which was kind of a reconstructed language, and now at this point has a very good grammar. But the language of his soul was the language of what would be called the Beit Midrash, the house of study, you know, the place where learning happened in Hasidism. And that Hebrew is often considered poor in grammar, but, but rich in, in context. And that was the language Reb Zalman, like, uh, at one point he was uh, translating the Dhammapada <laughs> into, into this Hebrew of the Beit Midrash. Um, and he translated some of the songs of the Baal singers of India <laughs> into the, this Hebrew. And he also translated Hazar and Naik Khan's Toward the One prayer. Um, the Toward the One goes like this. Toward the one, the perfection of love, harmony, and beauty. The only being, united with all the illuminated souls, who form the embodiment of the master, the spirit of guidance. That's Hazrat Anaykhan's Toward the One, his kind of main prayer. And all, all of us Anayati Sufis say this prayer as a, as a kind of invocation. Um, Reb Zalman translated it into, again, the Hebrew of the Beit Midrash, again, the Hebrew of learning and Hasidic texts, um, in this way. Likrat ha'echad, hayachid ha'echad v'cham yuchad, shleimut ha'emet, ha'tzedek v'hatiferet, hanimse ha'yachid, ha'kol al-kol ha'neshemot ha'ne'erot, Yotzre Hag Shamat Harabi Haruach HaKodesh. Now, the interesting thing about that is that it really is a, a little bit clunky Hebrew, but it's on purpose. It's Hebrew that has reference in Hasidism. The other thing that's interesting is it doesn't quite say toward the one, the perfection of love, harmony, and beauty, the only being united with all the illuminated souls, etc. If you were to translate it back into English from now the Hebrew, it would say something like this. Likrat ha'ichad is toward the one. That's still the same. But then he added a line, unique, alone, unified. Because in Hebrew, you got to make sure that you're making the point that this is about non-dualism and the toward the one wasn't quite doing it for Reb Zalman. So he chose a line that had some reference in the Hasidic and Kabbalistic tradition and then adapted it a little bit. And that's the line that says, Hayachid ha'echad v'cham yuchad, unique, alone, unified. So it's toward the one, unique, alone, unified, the completion of truth righteousness and beauty the only one in existence who contains all the illuminated souls forming the actualization of the master the spirit of holiness ruach hakodesh the spirit of holiness instead of uh, why, why is it going out of my head i know this prayer my whole life the spirit of guidance uh, the spirit of guidance in you know in judaism would be Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit that comes and, and offers wisdom. Mm -hmm. So those are the two prayers, maybe three prayers, you know. Yeah, right. Coming right. from the English into the Hebrew and then translated back, it's a little different. <laughs> I love that. And I love just the, like you said, the, I, I'm forgetting that there's a term that you use that is just sort of like the, the power behind it or the, the mysticism behind it. And it feels like, you know, each version holds its own kind of container of the sacred with it and mm -hmm. has like a different experience and connection to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah. So thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm really kind of appreciating this thread of, of this emerging Inayati Maimuni lineage. And, um, you know, you said, you know, Reb Zalman was, he was initiated as a sheikh, as a master, but it was more of an honorific, you know, until he knew what to do with it. It was an honorific term, but, um, but, you know, at some point, you know, he said, I'm an uncle and not a papa. And I, I, I love that. I mm -hmm. love that sort of way of thinking about it. But, uh, you know, at some point he did, he did become a papa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in, in the book, you, you tell, you know, you yourself was a, were a, a student at Naropa. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you shared that and you're at the University of Michigan studying religion. Michigan right? State. Michigan State. Yep. And um, with some background in, in Hinduism, which we share. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you, you came to Naropa primarily to study with Reb Zalman, but along the way you picked up Buddhism and, um, you know, we're deeply interested in many different contemplative practices and traditions. But, um, you know, Sufism wasn't exactly in your, in your ballpark, right? Yep. And, um, but you, you share a story of as you're coming to the, the end of your time at Naropa and you're tr trying to think about, you know, where would you be going next and what direction that you might have, that was like a, an important meeting that you had with Reb Zalman and wondering if you would share that story with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like Greg said, I was at Michigan State University and I was a student of history of religions and a pretty serious student, but I was kind of reaching that, that, that point inside, actually almost a crisis, where I, there was a realization that I was becoming an academic. And and I thought I was fine with that, but I remembered that that's not where I started. Hmm. Learning about religion was because I was truly a devotee. And then I was kind of uh, shocked to discover myself one day an academic. Hmm. And a, a little bit divorced from the truth of the path and a connection to my heart. And it was, it was, a, it was a, almost a revelatory moment for me. And, and I shifted my orientation, asking the question, no, I'm tired of reading about where does the real thing exist? And even more, how can I become that thing? And, and it was like, and I'm tired of reading about spiritual masters. Where does one exist? You know, as I would have phrased it then, you know, enough about Martin Buber or Abraham Joshua Heschel. Where, where is such a person now? And, and I had remembered that I had maybe a year before come across an article in an old journal from 1960 by a Rabbi Zalman Schechter. <laughs> uh, and there was, a, I think, even a picture of him in a black hat, you know, full beard. And he was at that time an Orthodox Hasid, um, you know, in 1960. But somehow that name came back into my head. And, and I, you know, I went to my computer and in those days it was probably like Alta Vista or something, you know, that, I, you know, there was Google wasn't the thing. <laughs> and I looked up, you know, Zalman Schachter and I discovered that he was no longer, you know, contained within this narrow, uh, this narrow world, but he was now a, a well-known figure and uh, a heretic to some, you know, an inspiration to others. And he was then occupying a position called the World Wisdom Chair at Naropa, what was then the Naropa Institute. And he had the World <laughs> Wisdom Chair. And, and I just knew that's where I had to go. And of course, I had to convince my then wife. <laughs> um, and I also had the, the feeling like, um, uh, this was a, a major shift in trajectory for me because I was then on the path to becoming, you know, professor of religion somewhere. Yeah. I am that now, but uh, I had to come back to it in a way yeah. by making this choice. This was not the trajectory to becoming professor of religion. <laughs> uh, but I, I knew I had to meet this person. And so I came to Naropa and entered the Indo-Tibetan Buddhist Studies master's program because I was a student of history of religions and I hadn't really studied Buddhism very thoroughly to that point. 
So that was the excuse that I would enter this program, study Buddhism, but my real purpose was to meet the world wisdom chair holder. <laughs> and, um, and uh, Reb Zalman's offices used to be in what are now, the, what is now the, um, you know, the schoolhouse building. And now, now there's a classroom. If you come in toward the stairs and you go to the left, there are two classrooms. The second classroom used to be a set of offices and his office was in there. And um, maybe in the first week after he'd had us write some reflection papers, I walked into the building and he came out of his office at the same time I walked in the building and he pointed at me. And I don't know how he knew who I was because it was the first week of classes and I hadn't even introduced myself. And he went like this. <laughs> And I stepped into his office and he said, I want to talk to you about your paper, but I don't know how he knew <laughs> my paper was connected to this face. <laughs> um, and from that day, he kept me a little closer, like he paid attention to me and I don't know what it, what it was exactly that um, made him make that opening for me, but it was exactly what I wanted. You know, that's why I was there. You know, that was my unannounced purpose. And, you know, almost two years later, I was getting ready to graduate. And, and it wasn't me that was wondering what I would do next. It was mm. him. And he again, I was walking through the building and he called me <laughs> into his office. And it's maybe April of 2000, I'm getting ready to graduate. I think 2000 was the year it changed to the Neuro, to Naropa University too. And he called me into his office and he just pointed to a chair. I sat down and he said, I want to talk to you about your future. And I think he thought that I might be leaving with graduation. I never told him that the whole reason I came to Naropa was to study with him. And so I wasn't going anywhere <laughs> as long as I could hang around in his orbit. Um, but he said, I want to talk to you about your future. And, and then he, he said, he said, I could make you a rabbi, but I'm not sure that it would serve your soul well. And <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this. He said, he says, I use less than 10% of the information I learned to become a rabbi. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah. He says, I don't know that you need to become burdened with that. And, and then he sat down in a chair opposite me and, and he often, if he wanted to think about something, he would sit and rock, you know, in Hasidism, we call it shuklin. And he rocked with his eyes closed and then he began to talk and he said, I can see on what levels your soul is Jewish, but it doesn't he said, um, but I don't feel like it is necessarily your purpose in this life to speak as a Jew or for Jews, like to be a rabbi, um, that that may not be your purpose. And with eyes still closed, still rocking, he said, he says, if you can stand to exist at the crossroads of religion in that uncomfortable place, you're going to help a lot of people. And then he opened his eyes and said, what do you know about Sufism? <laughs> now I was thrown by the entire conversation. <laughs> like I didn't know what was happening. Um, uh, I understand it better now, you know, but it's, you know, it's 21 years later. Um, I didn't know that the crossroads of religion was an uncomfortable place. I know that now. Um, it's much more comfortable to have an established place to sit and be. And to be in the middle is a tension place. Uh, and he was also right. But if I could stay in that place, if I could endure it, that I would learn lessons that the people that were coming would need to know. Mm. And then when he asked me, what do you know about Sufism? It was such a non sequitur. <laughs> Uh, like, I hardly knew how to answer. Um, and I, I like to make this point now, like, I didn't come to Reb Zalman to learn Sufism. 
I came for Judaism and Hasidism. <laughs> so this was just so weird to me. But I, I was down for whatever he was going to bring up. Down, up. <laughs> and so I said, well, I, you know, in college, I've studied a little Al-Ghazali, you know, Sufi master, and I've done, you know, and I studied with a Quran scholar, you know, at Michigan State. And so I have some background in this. I think I like Sufism, but I really don't know that much. And then he told me the story I told earlier, mm. how he'd become a Sufi sheikh. And, and he told me that he was an uncle and a papa up to this point. He said, and I haven't wanted to initiate anybody, but I'm going to initiate you. And he says, and this, is, this will be our deal. We will continue to learn Hasidism together, Hasidut. Mm. And we will continue a dialogue about religions and their interrelationship. And and you also become a Sufi initiate, and I'm going to give you two mentors in the Sufism, you know, to kind of raise you up in Sufism parallel to what we're learning in Hasidism. And so that was a process of years of learning both traditions at the same time in dialogue with Reb Zalman until I was neither one nor the other, but a kind of a combination of both. A merging of the oceans. Yeah, a merging of two oceans which is a kind of homage title, The Merging of Two Oceans. There, there's a book in, in Farsi or Persian uh, from Renaissance India by a Sufi master who wrote a book called The Merging of Two Oceans. Uh, and he was talking about the parallels between Vedanta and Sufism back in the 16th century, which was pretty remarkable. So I'm borrowing, this is an homage to that title. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing some of that story and how this has come into being. Um, yeah, those I think those those moments of guidance and of of of, of being, you know, asked to to step into something, I can really feel the the power of that yeah. and the uh, the spirit of guidance that was moving through even from Michigan State. Mm -hmm. What I'm grateful for now, and that I didn't understand then, was uh, Reb Zalman's insight. Sufism so stu suited my style of being. I had no idea, though. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have an equal love of Hasidism, but somehow my style of presentation is somehow a little more oriented Sufi. And so it was remarkable insight. Mm. Uh, that I wasn't really able to appreciate for more than a decade. And really, it was actually only after he died that I really came into full appreciation of the, that insight from 2000. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, that, and that time sort of to, to integrate and acclimate and, you know, experiment. You know, one of the, you know, one of the, the things you go on to talk about as you continue that story in the book, is that you know after after he gave you your initiation, and then as you continued, at some point you know you you gave your first initiations, and that sort of um, sort of raised this question as to like, well, you know, Reb Zalman was was initiated as a sheikh, but more of as an honorary thing, but now all of a sudden there's this thing that's emerging, and you know what is that? And then you know the the international order you know, gets wind of these initiations that are happening and all of a sudden there's like some questions around, you know, what, what is happening? Yeah. And, um, yeah. But, <laughs> you want me to... Yeah, you want to talk about it a little bit? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I caused a little trouble. Um, after a few years with Reb Zalman, he began, you know, when I met Reb Zalman, he was 74 and he was already kind of not taking students anymore. And so I'm really among his youngest students. Um, many of the senior students were 20 to 30 years older than me. And, and so I was always kind of this, you know, you know, very young man among the pack of older students. And, uh, and yet he moved me along kind of quickly, more quickly than I was comfortable with. <laughs> and at a certain point he began, sending the, the young people that would come to him, people that were sometimes three, four years younger than me, and they would come to him, and then he would send them to me. 
and he kind of gave me kind of ordinations to work with them and you know in specific ways and at a certain point it became clear that there was somebody I should initiate within Sufism mm. and and I had a kind of a kind of boldness you know that you you can have when you're very confident about your own teacher I was not a <laughs> tremendously confident person myself but I had high confidence in Reb Zalman and I you know I, I think I put it in the book that I was you know a, I was a soldier in an army of two, you know, <laughs> you know, and the other one was a general and, and I felt great about that. And so I did this initiation and, and it kind of got back to people who were Sufi leaders, you know, in parallel situations. And, and there was a question like, can you be giving initiations? And and you know and and i was literally questioned about it and i thought well yeah i think so um and and i said i have the trust of my teacher i don't know what other authority to recognize if my teacher says i can do it then i think i can do it and you know and it was a little bit put to me that uh well zalman shakta can do a lot of things that other people can't do <laughs> But of course, you're not Zalman Schachter. <laughs> and, um, and it was a little bit like that. And I thought, well, okay, I, I get that. And, and somewhat implicit was, what am I teaching? Sufism or Hasidism or some sort of fusion? And by what right? And so I went back to Reb Zalman. And I said, I think I got us in trouble. <laughs> and he says, eh, no, don't worry about it. And he told me, he says, um, at this point, uh, Pir Velayat, his friend, was, was in the last year of his life, and he was sick. This was 2004. And, and Pir Velayat had passed uh, the leadership of, of his uh, lineage to his son, Pir Zia, who was about my age. And I had met Pir Zia a couple years old, uh, earlier. And Reb Zalman said, well, let's write a letter to Pir Zia. Write a letter with your credentials, and, and we'll see what he has to say. I had no idea what my credentials might be, so I wrote a kind of awkward letter saying, you know, this has been my path, and this is what's happened. And then I just kind of let it go, because, like, I, I had that confidence, like, well, whatever Reb Zalman says I can do, I'll do. Yeah. And, and I wasn't too worried about what the answer would be. But Piercia wrote back a lovely letter because for him, Reb Zalman was like his uncle. Mm. You know, his father's good friend. They'd been on a tremendous journey to Mount Sinai together, you know, and his father and Reb Zalman climbing Mount Sinai and him as a little boy, you know. Yeah. And, you know, Reb Zalman's <clears throat> his uncle. And so Piercia writes back and he says, basically, when there's a new emphasis in the lineage, it branches. Mm. And, and it says, basically, if the two of you are now um, doing a, 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 a Sufism that is influenced by Hasidism and has fused those two oceans, as it were, uh, then perhaps we should recognize the birth of a new order. Mm. And so... Just as a symbol of that, Pirzia created a document that's called a Khilafat Nama or an Ajazat Nama, which is kind of like a, a deed or a document of authorization or recognition of the new order and wrote up a lovely testimony to the, the mutual initiations that happened between his father and Reb Zalman and how that's given birth to this order. So from 2004, uh, there was a new Anayati Sufi lineage that had a different emphasis. And that technically made Reb Zalman the peer of that lineage. Now, within Anayati lineages, the head of the order, now there might be many murshids or sheikhs, but the head of the entire lineage is a peer. And so that made Reb Zalman a brand new peer, and he had one murid, <laughs> me, 
And so when Reb Zalman passed in 2014, 10 years later, then upon his passing, I became the, the peer of the lineage. So that's that's kind yeah. of how that came about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, through kind of holy boldness and like getting yeah. in trouble. Yeah, and so through that through that merging, you know, something new, literally a, a love child, yeah. a new a new thing has has emerged and is growing. Yeah. Um, and and one of the things you talk about in the book when you tell that story is, you know, just after that ordination was recognized, you know, there was a lot of excitement around it and there was a lot of interest and. Um, one of the things I remember about that part of the story is that, you know, it was a time when he said something like, well, I guess it's time to open the gates. But, um, but your response was that, and then you said that it was one of the times that you felt really adamant and really sort of empowered to kind of maybe disagree with what he was saying. Yeah. And you said, you know, this isn't the time to open the gates. This is actually the time to close the gates. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about, you know, why you did that and what it was like to sort of stand yeah. in that spot of like, I have a, my own understanding of what needs to happen here. Yeah. <laughs> if there's anybody out there listening who was Sufi and Jewish at that time that was very excited about a new Sufi Jewish order, or Sufi Hasidic order, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one to blame that, you know, something didn't happen at that time. So yeah, it did that the creation of an order, it's not as if it didn't exist. There was already lineage once Reb Zalman had uh, made me his, um, in Sufi terms, his successor, his, his uh, Khalifa. Um, that was already happening, but when it, when it became an, a kind of an event that there was, you know, this kind of formal recognition, then it was a bigger deal, you know, the people, you know, like holy gossip that's out there people hear about it <laughs> and of course from the mid 60s on many disaffected jews you know who had left judaism and become sufis saw this as a way uh, of saying oh there's a there's a legitimate this you know there's a legitimacy to doing this and and some of the thought was oh well we could go become part of that order and, and, and I understood the impulse, you know, in many ways, it'd be like saying to your Jewish parents, like, oh, you see, there's a Zalman Shachter, it's hard to question his credentials. You know, he's as Jewish as it gets. And now, you know, see, he's Sufi, whereas, you know, it's, it'd be a way of like, coming home. Mm -hmm. And I really, I understood the impulse. And when that started happening, Reb Zalman says, you know, here in this house, this this is his office. He said to me, he says, well, maybe we need to open the gates. And I thought about it and I thought, it was one of those moments where I thought, and I'm not sure that that's right. I said, we're, we don't know what we are yet. Organically, what this is growing to become if if people flood in who for the last 30 40 years have been you know doing sufism other under other teachers with whatever motivations they come flooding in we're lost in their desires and and while i recognize those desires We'll, we're going to lose the opportunity of discovering what our particular, in Sufi terms, what our particular meshreb is, what our character is. We don't know what this means. What, what is this fusion about? And I said, I really think maybe we should close the, close the gates for a while and do R&D, you know, <laughs> research and development and test things out, practice together you know, figure out how this feels inside, what teachings work together. And uh, so if it's any of you that I disappointed, it was me. <laughs> and that went on for about 10 years. Really, the gates were mostly closed. And really, yeah, to the end of his life. Yeah. And, and, and by then, I had a good sense of what things were. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, you know, that's true. Um, and it, it feels to me like as I was reading, as I've been reading this book and sitting with it, you know, and, and maybe it's, it's a question I want to ask, but it, it feels like, you know, you're maybe more seated in 
who you are and what this lineage wants to be. And I'm curious, like, how are the gates now? Hmm. Well, I think when Reb Zalman was alive, we put a lot more emphasis on, uh, well, well, let me say something. There's a, there's a question in, in the Q&A that's about, you know, what's the difference between universalist Sufism and Islamic Sufism? And I'll try to do this rather quickly here. Yeah. Um, but when Hazrat and Ayat Khan brought Sufism into the West, it was a question for him. Do I need, you know, it's like, do they have to become Muslims to become Sufis? Mm. And that didn't seem right to him. And so... In addressing a new audience, he realized, oh, Sufism is 1400 years old. It has a body of traditions. It's a, it's a technology unto itself. It could be applied to your Christianity, to your Judaism, etc. And just, just in doing that, a kind of universalist Sufism was born, where the Sufism became a tradition unto itself that could be applied. And so... You know, one of the ways that Reb Zalman and I addressed the question in the beginning was looking at ways um, people could practice their Judaism in a Sufi manner. You know, in the style of a Sufi and some of the structures of Sufism, but using Jewish teaching, just the way Islam might be used. And, and we did that for a number of years and looked at uh, different practices and did them together. Um, for myself, later on, after he was gone, it was clear that my emphasis was a little different. Mine, the hyphen between, you know, it was not so much Sufi, Sufi Judaism, but it was Sufi Hasidism. The hyphen <coughs> connected these two esoteric lineages. Mm -hmm. And that's been my, um, my, my meshrab, you know, is how do we combine in, in a very organic manner um you know the magisteria of both traditions you know so that we have a greater um toolkit and teaching kit and uh and recognizing the differences and and the authentic you know ways those traditions are held but are benefiting from both mm. so i think that's been the yeah. way of it for me yeah thank you and yep. for those of you that are maybe interested in in picking this book up and giving it a read you know there there are chapters in there when we don't we probably don't have time to talk about it today but you know they, where you talk about practices that combine the holy names of allah with the sefi wrote and um you know some historical um investigation and then um i want to say maybe like divination or realization of you know ancient you know um jewish practices of zikr mm -hmm. and how those might have been done in uh, in particular cultures and settings and so yeah. there's a lot of rich sort of practice oriented material in this book as well um but uh we're we're getting close but there's just one other thing i want to speak to and you you brought it up you know standing at the crossroads of inner spirituality and um one of the things you mentioned is that one of the reasons that Reb Zalman actually wanted to take initiation as a Sufi was this idea of, of Shirag, which is like of, of being like a, a more universal priest and that being, being a Sufi actually gave him more freedom to um, interact with people that were not maybe not necessarily Jewish. Um, but yeah, so you, you are standing at the crossroads and you, there's this new, new lineage that's emerging, but you're also very much involved in inner spirituality in general and you know you have a foundation that you're a part of Karis Foundation and I'm just curious with these last few minutes if you'd like to just share a little bit about how you see both inner spirituality and and I guess you know and grounded spirituality and how you see those things you know moving forward in the future hmm. well I think you know the example that we've given the merging of two oceans and and looking at how two traditions can come together organically not as a 
not as like a Frankenstein, you know, you know, sort of experiment, you know, what things can we sew together to make a, a super person. But some things are on the planet are just bumping into up against one another. Like, if we're in office situations, the person we're sitting next to might be from Pakistan, you know, uh, and, and just more and more, we're in frequent contact and and it's leading to a situation just like, you know, in the biological world or in, you know, in the world of particles. Particles are bumping up against one another. They're exchanging electrons. You know, new chemical bonds are formed, you know. And that, that's happening with religions. And this is just one example that there's a, there's a hyphen that's now connecting two things. And, and increasingly, we're becoming increasingly hyphenated. Like a, a dedicated Christian might also be a Jungian therapist, you know, uh, a scientist who is otherwise an atheist might have a very sincere yoga practice. And it's just, we're connecting all of these things. And I think that kind of mortis and tenion construction in religions is going to continue. And sometimes when I say that, people are afraid that, you know, our, our historical traditions are going to disappear. I'm not saying that at all. I'm a great lover of those traditions. But they are going to continue to evolve. And I really feel that this kind of construct of increasing hyphenization is going to go in directions that we can hardly imagine and will continue. And, and you know... You know, we say, you know, sometimes in Judaism, we talk about, you know, uh, meeting in the house of prayer for all peoples. Uh, hopefully that's what's being built mm -hmm. over time through this kind of increasing connection. It's, it also increases the surface tension mm -hmm. between our traditions. But that's something to get worked out, you know. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think we're um, we're getting close to our time. I want to thank you for this opportunity to just bring your story and this book into the room and really bring it to life. Um, and I I was I wanted to ask if you'd be willing to to close with a blessing. Um, there's a a lovely part of that story you were talking about when when Rav Zalman was speaking to you about your future and then or maybe I think it was after maybe after one of your ordinations he was kind of speaking to you about you know, the duties of, of being a, a peer or a spiritual leader and, and just this idea that the blessings are above and waiting to be called down. And I feel like this has been a very blessed evening and I, I would love if you could call down some blessings for us to close. <laughs> <laughs> it's something Reb Zalman would have done even at a talk at Naropa. And he might have ended the evening saying, talking about blessings. And he was very serious about this that yeah he's he says we often think of you know that there's somebody that's qualified to bless you know or somebody that has blessings to give and he says that's not really the way of it he says that uh people are conduits of blessing that blessing is something that is waiting above you know in you know, in the body of the universe, which is, you know, a mother's body. And, and when the mother has a child, and, and the child cries, the milk that's in the breast lets. And it only lets in response to the cry of the child. And he says, it's a lot like that, that blessings are waiting. And, and it's, it's our cry that creates the letting of the milk of, you know, blessing. And he says, but don't, there's nobody to wait for. You know, one aspect is crying. The other aspect is realizing that the, the blessing is waiting to be channeled down. And there's nobody to be responsible for it but you. That we can all become vehicles of blessing and have to take responsibility for that of crying at the right time, but also crying for others. And, and there's nobody to come save them. 
but you. There's nobody to wish them well but you. There's nobody to channel that blessing but you. And so, you know, at a point like this, he would encourage us all to become vehicles of that grace and that blessing and to uh, become empowered to be blessers. And sometimes quiet blessers, you don't need any credit for it. Sometimes it's putting a hand on the back of a friend in a moment of need where words are not going to help, but standing with them and internally touching that place of kavana intentionality where you want to direct your best wishes for them. You're wishing them everything that they might need. And sometimes that's the only help you can offer. But we have to take responsibility for doing that. And so it's not so much my blessing, except to become the channel of this teaching that we can all close our eyes for a moment and reach above and channel down and direct some blessing somewhere to some place that we think it's important that needs a moment of grace, a person that needs such grace. And I'm thinking of such a person right now, and you should think of such a person and see its accomplishment. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Natal. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Have a beautiful night. Thank you. Yeah.